Welcome, Joanna Baxter and the Platform Party. Good morning, conference. Are you recovered from the Labour Students Disco? I haven't. <laughs> um, so uh, this morning we're going to take the CAC uh, report in just a moment, but first uh, the Chief Scrutineer is uh, going to uh, give us the results of yesterday's ballot. Chair, Conference, Sean Woodcock, Chief Scrutineer. I will now report the results of the ballot held at the conference yesterday. The results for the election for the constituency section of the National Constitutional Committee, five members to be elected by CLP delegates only. Voting for the constituency section is recorded as actual votes cast. Votes cast are as follows. Hugh Goldborn. 191,208. Annabelle Hall, 78,818. Jabran Hussein, 67,597. Brampreet Kaur, 173,094. Dave Levy, 50,341. Sem Moema, 192,057. Sue Pugh, 
207,694. Shanid Mayor Richards, 188,721. Marion Roberts, 72,404. I therefore declare the following candidates elected. Hugh Goldborn, Grandpreet Kaur, Sen Moema, Sue Pugh, Sinead Mayor Richards. There are no more ballots at conference this year. Thank you very much, conference. Thank you very much, Sean. And as Sean says, there are no further ballots today. Can we have a special round of applause, please, for Sean and the scrutineers and the tellers and the ballot staff, please? They've kept the show on the road the past few days. Now, conference, there's going to be a lot of thank yous uh, today, um, well-deserved thank yous. Um, more of those later, but uh, given that she's now trending on social media, I wanted to give a very special shout out and thank you to our director of events, Carol Linforth. She is an absolute legend. Oh. Carol is an absolute legend and this conference would not be what it is without Carol's contribution. So thank you for everything that you do, Carol. Now, um, conference, we have the final CAC report of conference. Can I ask Harry to present his report? Chair, conference, for a lot of people will be glad it's the final report, but <laughs> it said CAC 4 contains detailed timetable for today on this, our final day of conference. Today, we have timetabled for debate composite motions on industrial strategy, education and skills, and the NHS fit for the future. These motions can be found on pages six through to nine. The results from yesterday's ballot have already been announced. And again, congratulations to all those elected. Today, we have plenaries on breaking down the barriers to opportunity and on NHS Fit for the Future, as well as our international speaker, Alexander Konienko. I hope that everyone has had a positive and productive and an enjoyable conference to date. The CAC would like to thank everyone involved and all the party staff who have delivered such a successful event. Thanks also to you, the delegates, who have spoken in our debates in a constructive and positive way and to the NEC chairs who have done a difficult job fitting in a huge amount of work of important business at conference. We asked delegates at the beginning of conference to play their part by treating each other with dignity, kindness and respect. However, I do have to bring the conference attention that I do have to report that CAC have been made aware of cases where staff have suffered verbal abuse. Conference, this is totally unacceptable. The CAC itself will not stand for any abuse of Labour Party staff or any staff at all employed to make this conference the amazing event it is. Both the staff teams and the CAC review conference each and every year. And I ask you, the delegates, please complete the survey that you will be sent out following conference. We want to hear your views and your opinions and your experience so that we can continue to improve year upon year on your experience as delegates at conference. And for those delegates who may be required to leave luggage or baggage, that can be found in the MS Bank Arena next to conference services, and they are open until 3 p.m. today. Conference, can I ask you to join with me in thanking the stewards, accessibility stewards, police, security staff, the contractors and venue staff for all their work during this conference. <laughs> and on a personal note, I wish to thank my fellow CAC members for all their difficult role at conference and the build-up to conference. 
there is a lot of work and a lot of effort goes into this work by the CAC, the Secretariat and support team who are with us all the way and who, without their help and assistance, along with my colleagues in CAC, it would make it difficult. My role is the easy part of that, fronting up, delivering our message on an ongoing daily basis. Again, collectively, the CAC, often criticised, Sometimes misunderstood, normally the mainly the nameless faces in terms of that. Can I say that my colleagues on the CAC are in here every morning, sitting right in front of me. They are there for my moral and physical support, just in case I get rushed at the stair. I doubt, I doubt I'll get any glitter on me, but at the end of the day, the issue will be that they are there. They are, again, I'd like to place on record my personal thanks for all the work that they do, all the support that they give me. And again, they've been a pleasure to work with. And I will sadly miss their involvement and participation. So from CAC, I wish you all an enjoyable and final day at conference and a safe journey home following the conclusion of conference. Conference, I submit my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, can I ask if anyone wants to ask any questions or raise any points on the Conference Arrangements Committee report? I have a delegate there. Oh, yep, and uh, another delegate there. Are there any, any further? No, thank you. Thank you, conference, um, and thank you, Harry, for his report and for an excellent conference. Um, I would like to, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit hard of hearing, so I may have missed it, but in the report, um, I think there was something missing. Um, over the last four days, and I assume the women's conference as well, uh, they, we've had enthusiasm, smiles, and extraordinary professionalism from the signers uh, in our midst, the, the three signers. I think um, some of us who have been going to conferences long enough will remember that the signers used to sit right at the sand, right at the end of the podium, and anyone who needed their services had to huddle around that area. And now we have um, our signers up on the screen and um, I hope someone on the panel will be able to give a thanks to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for making that point, Delegate. Morning conference. My name's Debbie Armager from Lincoln CLP. <laughs> conference, I would like to address an urgent matter of concern that has unfortunately affected my time at conference. The accessibility to the leader's speech and the wider event has not only been inadequate, but at times have been dangerous. The chaotic arrangements of the queues without barriers 
or proper crowd management pose a significant risk. A gentleman whose disability might, have been, not, might not have been overtly visible was denied access to the accessible queue, forcing him into an already overcrowded line. Furthermore, I experienced the distress of being separated from my carer who was unjustly held back by bouncers and prevented from assist assisting me. Many attendees, including myself, were uncomfortably crammed into a constricted space, leading to aud audibly expressions of pain due to lack of crowd control. It's crucial to note that these accessibility concerns aren't new. They've been brought up before, and yet here we are again. My pressing question to the organisers and all involved parties is what measures will be put in place to address these concerns, ensuring that future events are safe and inclusive for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, uh, Ethan Jones, Clewid South CLP. Um, it's just a point on the CAC report this morning on page nine, appendix one, ballot results. At the bottom there appears to be a missing candidate, uh, Harry Stratton. Um, I just wondered if that, that, that had been picked up on and was going to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Conference. I, I didn't see anybody else indicating, so I'll ask Harry if he wishes to respond to those points. Thank you for the questions. In context of the question raised by Ethan, all eligible candidates were in the ballot and contained there. With regards to the issues regarding Debbie, in terms of that, we are aware of the issues that presented itself yesterday in gaining access. In particular, that's been referenced to the CAC and will form part of the work that is being done during the course of the year. And again, accessibility issues we have working with us. We have dedicated Katrina Murray on the CAC, who will be working closely with our accessibility stewards again as we move forward into next year. We do regret that that was the situation that arose. It certainly was not the intention, and we will work tirelessly, and the committee will work tirelessly to ensure that this is not repeated going forward. And again, we thank you for bringing that to our attention. We report with regard to signers, again, my sincere apologies if people feel that they've been left out. And covering trying to be a multitude, trying to name individuals is always difficult. But it is very much an indication of how we've moved on. And again, if it would be remiss if it wasn't mentioned. So again, I'll take the opportunity of thanking them personally on behalf of conference and the CAC. So again, we will ensure that that is not an omission at any point in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. If you can stay on the stage. Um, conference, um, you might not realise this, but um, this will be Harry's last year on the CAC. He has been on the CAC for 19 years. And he's been chair of the CAC since 2011. <laughs> Harry is kindness and professionalism to his core. And he has been a constant reassuring presence when almost everything around him has changed. Um, no matter what the controversy or debate uh, that we've had at conference, he has always been uh, there. Uh, he has um, he's diligently come to the podium uh, every morning, calmed everything down, calmed everybody down. And on behalf of the whole party and conference, Harry, I just want to uh, move a motion of thanks to you. Thank you.
Just to say thank you, conference. An honour I never expected, uh, and it's been a pleasure being on the CAC. Uh, I think they were wondering how they could get rid of me as chair anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> never mind. I mean, it's been a wonderful time, and I wish you all the best going forward. I'll be watching from afar, or I'll be here anyway, in terms of next year. But again, wonderful conference. We've got an opportunity. Changes in the air. You know it. I know it. And we'll be back next year, either before an election or after having won the election. Thank you. Harry has always, always been the best dressed person at conference as well. <laughs> um, as a special tribute, can we assume that Harry's final report to conference is carried? Thank you very much. So, delegates, we're now ready for uh, the next um, mission plenary, breaking down the barriers to opportunity. Um, we have two composite motions uh, today, one in this session and one in the next session. In this session, we will be taking composite 12 on the industrial strategy, education and skills. The first speaker is Jane Kirkham, a teaching assistant and Labour's candidate for Truro and Good morning, conference. My name is Jane Kirkham, and I'm proud to be the parliamentary candidate for Truro and Falmouth. Conference. <laughs> we have so much work to do. In Cornwall, wages are below average, and house prices are far above. We have a bright future in renewables, digital, arts, in people, but we need the skills, the training and the education to take advantage of it. We have been let down by a Tory government that over 13 wasted years has ignored our young people's education and limited their ambitions. In Cornwall, higher and further education are difficult to access students travel long distances on poor public transport and less than one-fifth of our disadvantaged students went to university in 2019. The inequality gap is widening grossly under this Conservative government but it just doesn't care. I was a teaching assistant in a secondary academy for seven years and I'm a governor in a primary school where more than half the children have free school meals now. I see the destruction of our school infrastructure every day. State preschool nurseries and wraparound care really doesn't exist where I live. The breakfast clubs and focus on early years that the next Labour government is putting at its heart will be a revelation in Cornwall and throughout Britain. They cannot come soon enough. The next Labour government will tear down the obstacles to opportunity, the class ceiling, that holds so many of our young people back. Conference, please welcome the woman who will deliver, the woman who will enable our young people to break through that ceiling, Labour Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Conference. Growing up in the North East in the 1990s, it was teachers and support staff like Jane who not only gave me an amazing education, but in doing so, taught me so much about why education matters. They saw the value and worth in each and every one of us. And I never forget that I'm standing here today 
Above all, because I was lucky. Lucky to have a family filled with love. Lucky to have a school that cared. And today I have the amazing good fortune to be Labour's Shadow Education Secretary with a fantastic team of ministers around me. Helen, Matt, Seema, Catherine, and in the Lords, Fiona, Debbie and Glenys. The conference, it goes to the heart of all of our values, that life should not come down to luck, that opportunity belongs to everyone, that the role of government is to extend opportunity, fundamentally to extend freedoms to each of us and to all of us. Freedom from fear, from ignorance, from illness, freedom from insecurity, from injustice and from poverty, freedom to achieve and to succeed, to learn and enjoy, to take part and to speak out. These are the opportunities which for 13 years this government has ripped away. Those are the freedoms our children deserve and it is the future which once again a Labour government will give them. <clears throat> Conference, I joined Labour not simply because I knew that Britain could be better, not just because I shared Labour's values, no, I joined Labour 25 years ago this autumn because I had seen what the Tories did to our country. Then, as now, the public realm literally crumbling around the next generation. And because I saw with my own eyes a Labour government making Britain better. Year by year, step by step, we did it then and we will do it again. And just as life shouldn't come down to luck, government cannot be left to chance. It's why Kira set out the five missions we will take from opposition into government. Because to be Labour is to believe that the future is something we shape together, not face alone. Conference, our missions speak to that ambition, that determination, that faith in our collective strength. Rising growth, falling crime, healthier lives, greener energy, and the greatest of all, a determination that for each of us and for all of us, background will be no barrier to opportunity and education is the key to that. Now, I don't need to remind you that we see every day how 13 years of conservative failure means children's backgrounds aren't just limiting their opportunities. It's worse than that. Conference for too many children across too much of our country, their backgrounds are ravaging their opportunities all their lives long. I tell you, it breaks my heart. And it starts with our smallest children. The Tories have committed to slashing staffing and standards in early years childcare, and they have no plan at all for early education. And as children grow, when school begins, the gaps widen just as the curriculum narrows. Because for our children, the teachers aren't there, aren't qualified, or it isn't their subject. The buildings are turning to dust. And just on Friday, we found out that the Conservatives had botched next year's school's budget by a staggering £370 million. The, next, the mess that the next Labour government is going to have to sort out in education simply beggars belief. Now, conference every parent wants the best for their children. Every parent, not just those who can afford it. Aspiration and ambition are for everyone, and so too must be excellence and opportunity. <clears throat> and I understand why parents worry about the education that the Tories are prepared to offer our children. Parents want their children to read and write, to master maths, but they want a lot more than that too. They want their children to learn about the joy of life too, to delight in music, to enjoy sport, to experience the beauty of art and to know the wonder of science. They want their children confident, ready to speak up and speak out. They want them to carry a love of learning right throughout life that sets them up to achieve and to thrive. Conference, I want those standards, those expectations, those dreams for every child.
because I worry that for too many children, that fire that education should kindle in every mind, it doesn't start or it doesn't catch. Now, the Prime Minister talks about extending maths to 18. But if young people hate maths at 16, it's just too late. These problems need to be tackled early, not left to fester. Apprenticeships down, qualification reforms botched, then junked. A levy on employers that doesn't deliver for companies or communities, for individuals or for our econom economy. Other people's children, our children, not theirs. Again, with universities, degrees are for their children, not ours. It's never their kids' choices or chances that they're keen to wind back. Student debt for nurses, for young people starting out, looking to buy a home and build a family, will change it for good. In every part of our system, in every year of our children's lives, in every corner of our country, Labour will be the party of high and rising standards. Now, conference, I think we all know what the private schools lobby think of our ambition. They were arrogant enough to write it down. Chippy. And if they or anyone else doubt my determination to deliver on our dream, then I have a very simple message for them. Chippy people make the change that matters. I will make the change that matters. Together we will make the change that matters. We will end the tax breaks that private schools enjoy to deliver high and rising standards in every school and for every child. Now, conference, our ambition starts as education starts at the beginning of all of our lives. Our childcare system must be about life chances for children as well as work choices for parents. That's why I am determined that new investment in childcare comes with ambitious reform to ensure that early education is available in every corner of our country for every family and for every child to drive up standards for our youngest children and lift up the amazing people who support and teach them. It's why we'll end restrictions on councils delivering childcare. It's why today I'm announcing that Sir David Bell, former primary school teacher and former chief inspector of schools, will lead Labour's work to develop the early years plan the next generation deserve. to bring high and rising standards for the workforce we'll need, for the qualifications they'll have, for the settings where it will happen, for the education they'll give, to deliver on our ambition of a modernised childcare system, supporting families from the end of parental leave to the end of primary school. Conference, high and rising standards cannot just be for parents who can afford them. I want them for my children, for your children, for all of our children. And that's why as children start at primary school, we'll deliver breakfast clubs to start the school day, funded by closing the tax loopholes for the global super rich. It's why we'll roll out early interventions to transform children's speech and language skills and tackle the attainment gap in settings across our country. It's why we'll bring in the school support staff negotiating body because we know it's support staff as well as teachers who deliver the change our children need and Labour will value and respect them just as much. And it's why I'm proud to tell you today that we'll tackle our chronic cultural problem with maths by making sure it's better taught at six, never mind 16. The last Labour government began a revolution in reading standards, a revolution still unfolding in our schools. And it's past time we brought that same focus to maths. One in four of our children leave primary school without the maths they need. That is a disaster. Maths is the language of the universe, the underpinning of our collective understanding. It cannot be left to the last years of school. And that's why I'm determined 
that Labour will bring maths to life for the next generation. Better training for teachers to teach with confidence and success. Better standards for our children so they're set up to succeed. Because be it budgeting or cooking, exchange rates or pay slips, maths matters for success. And I want the numeracy of all our young people need for life and for work, to earn and to spend, to understand and to challenge. I want that to be part of their learning right from the start. Conference, high and rising standards, a richer curriculum woven through with speaking, listening and digital skills through every subject and every year of school. It's why we'll invest in more teachers, in careers guidance, in mental health support, in work, of exp in work experience for all of our children in all of our schools. And we'll deliver those standards, not by ending inspection, but by improving it, with annual checks for the issues that matter most. And we won't stop there, because education doesn't end there. We'll change the way that students pay for their time at university, so none of our young people fear the price they'll pay for the choice they'd like. And after 13 years of drift, Labour will create Skills England to bring the leadership and ambition to England's skills system, a growth in skills levy, driving opportunity in every workplace. Technical excellence colleges right across our country. Skills not just for each of us, but for all of us. Training the next generation to build the greener, safer, healthier future we need. <clears throat> Ours will be a government with not just vision, but drive. Not just a dream, but a plan conference, the difference between us and the Conservatives isn't just about values, competence or ideas. It's simpler than that. It's all about hope. Not just hope for each of us, but hope for all of us. Hope for our society and our country as well as ourselves and our families. Hope that our greatest days are yet to come. Conference, Labour will again bring hope to a new generation. Labour is the party for the future we all deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was a fantastic speech, and um, she's going to be a brilliant Secretary of State for Education. Um, now, conference, we move our composite motion uh, listed from page eight of the CAC report. Can I ask delegates moving motions to please register at the speaker's desk? We start with composite 12, the industrial strategy, education and skills, to be moved by Unison and seconded by Usdaw. Good morning conference, my name is Karen Atkinson and I am proud to be here today moving this composite motion on behalf of my trade union, Unison. We're over there. Because we are here in Liverpool, I'd first like to pay tribute to the brave staff of Orchard Day Nursery, just up the road from here, who came together to negotiate for better pay after struggling for too long on low wages. Sadly, instead of listening to their concerns and rewarding their hard work, the bosses suddenly closed the gates to the nursery for good, putting 50 staff out of work and leaving 200 families scrambling to find alternative childcare. And if it can happen here, it can happen in your neighbourhood too. Our early years workers are some of the lowest paid people in the country, with little opportunity for career progression, leading to an often high turnover of staff. Our childcare sector is underfunded and precarious, our childcare workers are undervalued. I don't believe this is how we should treat those who look after our children. This is, after all, an essential service. My children are now seven and four. My youngest has just started school. 
So those nursery days are sadly just behind us. But I will remember forever the amazing staff who loved and cared for my kids. They do incredible work and should be fairly rewarded. Conference, this motion is about ensuring that an individual's background is no barrier to opportunity. And to make this a reality, we need to begin by investing in our early years sector. It is the foundation for everything. And we mustn't stop there. We need to invest in our schools, in further education, and in our universities. Our education sector is literally crumbling around us. There are buildings too dangerous to work in, and staff using food banks. Early years practitioners and support staff in our schools, colleges, and universities too often forgotten. Their essential roles not properly rewarded. Which is why I was so heartened to hear Bridget make her commitment to restoring the school support staff negotiating body in England. This will bring back the opportunity for proper recognition for that workforce, leading to genuine progression and fair pay. But let's not stop there. We need to reverse the Tory cuts to further education, because how else will we grow the skills required for economic growth and to tackle climate change? And we need a funding model for universities that ends low pay for staff and provides an excellent education for our students. Because conference, education is the bedrock of economic growth, of good jobs and of the just transition that will create green jobs for everyone's future. Education opens doors, but only when we invest in the staff who make it possible. Conference, please support this motion. Chair, Conference, Jane Jones, Ulstor, seconding Compsite Motion 12. Conference, the world of work is undergoing a period of rapid transformation, global challenges and a cost of living crisis and developments in new technology have all created an uncertain and changing environment and choices made by successive Tory governments have seriously undermined skills and development. They've needlessly scrapped the union learning fund in England and consist consistently failed to address huge flaws in the apprenticeship levy, leaving the country completely unprepared for the challenges that lie ahead. This appalling record must be reversed before it's too late. Labour is already committed to developing and supporting a modern skills system. This will be a huge piece of work. We need more support for further education and training providers to help deliver meaningful and effective lifelong learning and we need a legal right to time off paid for training so that all workers have the opportunity to advance and develop new skills. Because in reality, the majority of working people simply can't afford to take time off work uh, unpaid to train. We also need urgent and, un and fundamental reform of the apprenticeship levy. The levy has been a complete disaster, with one third fewer people starting an apprenticeship since it was first introduced. Labour is already committed to reforming the levy into a growth and skills levy to deliver accessible training and development opportunities for workers, especially disadvantaged workers, and to give businesses the flexibility they need. Conference workers both need and deserve a real say in Labour's skills strategy. Trade unions have a fantastic record of supporting workers into training, and we have insight from our members into what's happening in the workplace. Conference, it's clear that only a Labour government working closely with unions can deliver the skills system needed to secure the future for Britain so that all workers can benefit from changing world of work. Conference, please support. Thank you for those contributions. We're now going to open up for... Um, open up to discussions from the floor. I will pick speakers in rounds of four. Um, so, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get a geographical balance, but I might not be able to fit everybody in. Uh, there is a delegate right um, on the edge. Yep, you just wait. Yep, that lady there. Um, there is a, a gentleman just in front of me there. And uh, there is a Delegate uh, blonde hair. Yeah, you've just waved at me. No, 
the lady behind you, yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a delegate just over there. Thanks. Good morning, conference. Uh, my name is Councillor Elizabeth Roberts, first time delegate and first time speaker. Um, also hopeful uh, West Mercia PCC candidate. Um, so I stand before you um, as somebody that has lived experience and I, I assume many, many before me are the same. I came to the Labour Party in 2019 because of the way that my neurodiverse twins have been treated within education. My son, autistic, ADHD and PDA, had a statement of special educational needs and was illegally expelled at the age of six. That was the first night my son attempted his life. I caught him within seconds of hanging from his cabin bed because the headmistress had said, and I quote, he wasn't good enough for mainstream education. And since then, I have been fighting on behalf of him and 3,000 other families within Shropshire. We have... Si Thank you. <laughs> I have since been part of a group of two to set up two specialist schools, one in Ludlow and one more recently in Shrewsbury called Keystone Academy. And we support, uh, we, we are teaching now, we've gone from 28 people to 70. Uh, their neurodiversities are a broad range, but what they do ex expel in is their own interests, their subject of interest. And what we aim to do is interweave that interest throughout the curriculum. And we ask that the Labour Party do the same. Many of our children cannot cope in mainstream education. They just, they're so badly traumatised by how they have been, uh, the, the saying is, uh, smacked on the, the a round head into a square hole. You lose so many fabulous parts of our young people and they really struggle to come back. Many are trauma-based and are really struggling to survive, never mind be educated. So my request from thousands across the entire United Kingdom is please educate our neurodiverse children as they would like to be taught and understand that what drives them can really support their need. My eldest twin, her, her um, experience was going through dance. She now dances on and off the English National Ballet. And it proves to you, conference, that our children, if given the right support and the understanding that makes the whole of the neurodiverse pupil we can make them thrive. We can enable them to be fantastic members of our community. Could I also worked in Shrewsbury Prison, and um, it was thought then that 75% of the prison population are undiagnosed neurodiverse. And they have got to that point because they have self-medicated, because the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service has not been there to support them Could due to cuts, cuts by Conservatives. So I really do push for everyone to support this motion. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Good morning, conference. I'm Lauren Rhodes. Um, despite my accent, I'm here proudly representing Glasgow Kelvin. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about access to the arts and culture. Despite describing themselves as the natural defenders of our customs and heritage, the Conservatives have created a crisis in our civic museums and heritage services. Their total lack of seriousness is demonstrated by the fact we have had 12 Secretaries of State for DCMS over the last 13 years. And 13 years of austerity and the cost of living crisis have left our sector reeling. It is an honour and a privilege to work in museums and heritage, providing the backdrop to people's precious memories. But there has also been pain, as restructures and redundancies have led to a huge loss of knowledge and expertise and opportunities, especially in learning, education and outreach. Education doesn't just take place in schools. We know that the arts, creative learning and cultural visits enrich a young person's educational experience. And in some parts of the country, just only over half of the children in schools experience a cultural visit. 
Museums increase our sense of well-being. They help us feel proud of where we come from. They can inspire, challenge and stimulate us. And cultural visits are proven to help mental health. Not only this, but last winter, our museums provided a lifeline, um, providing uh, warm banks for communities. Museums enhance everyone's life chances by breaking down barriers. And despite the ongoing cuts and the attempts to drag us into their culture wars, we continue to strive to do this through active public participation, working with our local communities and sharing our collections and knowledge. That's why I'm so happy to hear about Labour's National Cultural Infrastructure Plan and to hear how Thangham Debonair and Bridget Phillipson have been working together to embed cultural and creative education through this mission to break down barriers to opportunities. Museums change lives, and so will a Labour government. Thank you. Conference, I'm Matt Tumain, uh, Watford CLP and parliamentary candidate. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, conference, I want to talk to you about opportunity and access to it. When I was a child, I went to the local state school. And there, the children that I mixed with had parents who came from a very broad section of society. They were nurses, mechanics, airline pilots, and accountants. But the parents that I meet now, when I'm out in my constituency, they worry about their children getting into a decent local school with the resources that are needed and sufficient teaching staff. But I know that Bridget and her team will deliver on that under the next Labour government. Um, conference, we must broaden the horizons of opportunity for children and for adults, because a horizon narrowed is an opportunity squandered. Opportunity is for everybody. Opportunity is with Labour. Thank you. Just before the next delegate speaks, I'll um, take the next um, round of contributions, if that's okay. Um, so, the kind of blue card, you, yep. <laughs> um, I've got delegate there, and um, I'm going to go right over to the back, the other side. You just waved at me. There you go. Right, right at the back. You, you're standing up. Yep. <laughs> And, and the delegate just there. Yeah, thank you. Um, James Whiting, Associates Education Association. Um, good morning, conference. Um, I want to say a little bit about teachers. And I, I think Labour Conference is in a, a difficult position regarding um, teachers. I've been a member of this party for 40 years. And um, I have not been able to come to conference until I retired. And of course, the uh, teaching unions are not affiliated, as are the um, unions representing support staff. So maybe a little bit of a gap in some of the voices uh, that Labour conferences hear. <laughs> First of all, I want to speak in favour of the composite. I, I, I've got some suggested improvements to it, but I want to start by saying that teachers need support because they are invaluable. And we support getting a proper training program, a proper salary program for those, for those staff. Now, one little bit of in your motion is mentions the word schools. Actually, over half of our schools are now academies. Um, and I also welcome what Bridget said about freedom. And I'm, what I'm hoping, too, is that teachers get back and support staff get back some of the professional autonomy they've lost over the uh, Tory years. This is the morning of a teacher now going into a secondary school with their tutor group. They have to follow a micro script. And on that script it says, welcome to class. Tell them one minute, second minute, get out your reading books. Third minute, put the reading books down the table. Four minute, uh, fourth minute, remind them of the behaviour policy. Five minutes, start reading. It's like that. There are teachers 
having to do that. It's no wonder that there are 75% of teachers that are saying, I'm thinking of leaving. We need to turn that around. We need to make sure that teachers have their professionalism back. Could, could you wind up, please, Delegate? Yeah, one of the other things I think we need, and very quickly, is uh, we need a proper um, pay uh, for teachers across academies, across all schools. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening, conference. Rebecca Lewis, Wickham Labour, first time at conference. Are there any school staff at conference today? So I've been teaching for 20 years and I think you'll join with me in agreeing that this is the worst things have ever been in education. So when I listened to Rishi's speech the other day and he said, what he is proudest of in the Conservatives' record since 2010 is their record in education. I nearly fell off my chair. So something that Keir said yesterday has really stayed with me. It's not that Rishi is lying, it's that he can't see the country before him. That's because the Tories don't send their, schools to, their children to schools like mine, schools where we're short-staffed every day, because our, our support staff are leaving for better paid jobs in retail. Schools where we have children self-harming in front of us in our classrooms because the waiting list for CAMS is two years. Schools where we have children going to sleep in our classrooms because they live in such overcrowded housing they are sharing beds with their siblings. Our head teacher is cleaning the school because the local private school has poached our caretaker. I talked to a young man in Wickham CLP. He's 16 years old. He's been taught his chemistry GCSE in a class of 62 because the private school poached his chemistry teacher. I urge you to support Composite 12 and make this chippy woman the next education minister. I urge you to do every single thing that you can to get a Labour government for the sake of children and staff in schools like mine. Thank you, conference. Hi, I'm Lauren Dingsdale, and I'm the delegate for Eltham CLP in South East London. And last year, I made history by being elected as a Labour and Cooperative Councillor in what was considered a very safe Tory ward in the Royal Borough of Greenwich. <laughs> Not only did I win the most votes in the ward, but I also took the, se the seat from the leader of the Greenwich Tories. I'm speaking today to support the motion on industrial strategy, education and skills. In the modern world, we need to ensure we're constantly training and upskilling our work workforce, giving opportunities to highly skilled jobs for everyone across Britain. I have two small children, two very energetic preschoolers, and I want to grow up in a country where my children had the same opportunities that I did. I was 10 when Labour came into power and I benefited immeasurably from a government that really cared about education, education, education. I grew up in a normal working family in the northeast of England in Middlesbrough. My dad worked at Teesside Power Station, my mum was a receptionist, and my brother benefited from a highly skilled apprenticeship and became a welder. And I was the first person in my family to go to university and I got into Oxford. All kids should have the opportunity to make the most of their talents, wherever they come from from high quality apprenticeships to improving access to our top universities for our state school students. Where you've come from shouldn't affect where you're going. But under 13 years of the Tory government, the class ceiling has never been higher. But to give the, our kids the opportunities they deserve, we need to start at the beginning. As a mum of young children, I am painfully aware of the problems we have in our early years sector. Too many parents, particularly women, are having to give up work or reduce their hours because they cannot afford childcare. 
This has so many knock-on effects. It affects their career paths and their earning potential. It causes skills gap in our workforces, but it also affects the life chances of our children. Studies have shown that children who've had good early years provision already start primary school with a massive head start. If we want to break down barriers to opportunity, we need an education system that works from the very beginning. We need to support our teachers and we need to give parents the opportunities to keep working if they want to. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you. I'm Sam Carling and I'm the youngest councillor on Cambridge City Council. Conference, there is a reason that in 1996 the words education, education and education resonated so strongly with the British people. Education and skills underpin our whole society and in these long 13 years of opposition, Labour and local government has never forgotten that. We are working to deliver the skills programmes we need across our economy, including training in retrofitting in the broader green sector, equipping small businesses and individual workers throughout our country to level up our infrastructure and create jobs in the process. I am proud to represent my council in that work at our combined authority under our phenomenal Labour Metro Mayor, Dr Nick Johnson. But conference, we are being held back by a national government that refuses to delegate to us the powers and crucially the funding that we need to do it right. Imagine how much we would achieve in skills with a Labour government in Westminster backing and building upon the work of our councillors, mayors and other representatives in our work in the nations and regions. Working hand in hand, we will deliver meaningful lifelong learning, ensuring everyone has the opportunity to achieve their ambitions. The whole country saw how little the Conservatives care about our young people when they threw exam grades under the bus during the pandemic. But anyone that knows the education system has been seeing and experiencing that lack of care for years. When I was going through school in a rural part of the northeast of England, I could see the impact of the Tories' callous funding cuts year on year. First, they closed the sixth form. After that, creative courses started to be closed. Cutting language courses soon followed. Extracurricular activities stalled and dwindled. And when the education system is failing our children, their ambition and ability to achieve is so heavily stunted. Adding more years of higher level maths and English will not fix the problems that start in earlier years of school. We have to revitalize the whole system and give the phenomenal people that work within it the recognition and remuneration that they need and deserve. All of our educators deserve so much better. Our children deserve so much better. So let's deliver something so much better. Thank you, conference. Hello conference, my name is Jonathan Akinitua, I'm a delegate from Greenwich and Willis CLP, first time delegate, first time speaking. <laughs> I am supporting composite motion 12, industrial, industrial strategy, education and skills. Attending school is critically important for children's life chances, including their attainment, well-being, safety and wider development. There are groups of young children who are more likely to miss school due to school exclusions. Every child has a right to education, but not every child enjoys that right. Children and young people excluded from school are 12 20 times more likely to have contact with social services, four times more likely to live in poverty, seven times more likely to have special educational needs, 10 times more likely to have mental health difficulties. Black young people are excluded four times more likely than their white peers. Children from gypsy, Roma travellers, communities, 13 times more likely to be excluded from school. <laughs> Mainstream education is not inclusive. I myself was excluded from school because I struggled with anxiety and I had learning difficulties. I was labelled as aggressive and disruptive, but I never received any pastoral or mental health support. My mother paid for me and my twin brother to complete our GCSE exams and A-levels, in which I'm here to stand here today as a delegate. Every child has a right to education, 
but not every child enjoys that right. I'm asking the Labour government to reduce school exclusions by incentivising schools to keep disadvantaged young children in school. We need to equip schools with resources to cater for additional needs. So I agree with Labour's plan to help with teacher training, help teachers to understand and walk with vulnerable young children, motivate teachers to let them know that these are the future leaders of our generation. Thank you, conference. Thank you for those contributions, delegates. So that concludes uh, the opportunity mission plenary. We're now moving on to the final debate, um, which is on the NHS Fit for the Future mission. Uh, that debate will include Composite 13, NHS Fit for the Future. In a, um, a moment, we'll hear from Wes Streeting, but first we have Nathaniel Dye, a music teacher and keen runner. Where do you see yourself in five years' time? I hope that everyone here would reply with, in government. Well, I'm an award-winning primary school music teacher. What about me? Perhaps I could rise to become a deputy or even a head teacher, or focus more on my music and make it on stage at Glastonbury. I could have a loving partner, a family of my own, Sadly not, because I have stage four incurable bowel cancer and in five years, it's all but certain that I will be dead. No career, no family, no opportunity. Cancer has robbed me of a promising future. Recently, I've been through chemotherapy and life-threatening emergency surgery, but this isn't the first time I've found myself in the caring hands of our NHS. Born at 28 weeks, I began my short life fighting for it in an incubator. I continue to fight by using every blessed window of wellness to live as fully as possible with as many marathons and ultra-marathons as my dwindling health allows. That's true. And I have chosen to work my way back into the most unforgiving vocation of teaching because the young children that I work with, they don't have money, they have me. And strange as it may sound, I can't think of a better use for the time I have left. <laughs> but if I'd been more aware of my cancer warning signs, perhaps I could have caught my metastatic disease at an earlier stage. And if the NHS had more capacity in the system for tests, scans, biopsies and treatment, my prognosis might not be quite as bleak. From GP contact to chemotherapy, just in time for my 37th birthday, I waited 15 weeks. This was all meant to happen within 62 days. I'm not the only person to have seen firsthand that the NHS isn't only broken at the sharp end, I've seen enough beds lining hospital corridors, but also behind the scenes. Wes Streeting, my local MP, has been to war with cancer and come out the other side. <laughs> Take it from me. This tells you a lot about a person. When you've been through day after day of agonizing pain 
and dealt with the stifling uncertainty. It gives you a newfound perspective of what's really important in life. People often wonder why I'm not tucked up in bed waiting to die. Well, I have an inspirational role model. Wes hasn't just chosen to live, but dedicated his life to public service. It's too late for me, but there's one person I trust to save and transform our NHS. Conference, I give you Wes Streeting, Labour's Shadow Health and Social Care Secretary. Nathaniel, it is truly an honour to have you with us here in Liverpool. When you came to see me in my advice surgery that Friday afternoon, I was moved by your spirit and your courage, your determination to follow your great passions music and education in the face of your terrible diagnosis blew me away. I also felt a deep sense of injustice that I feel now. The injustice that the NHS didn't reach you in time. The injustice that delay meant the difference between life and death. As a cancer survivor, it shakes me to my core. I owe my life to the NHS because it was there for me when I needed it. And not many people find themselves in a position to repay that kind of debt to the NHS, but I can. And I am determined to make sure that the NHS doesn't fail people like Nathaniel anymore. <laughs> it starts with gripping the crisis in front of us. 7.7 .7 million people waiting. The longest waiting list ever. And the audacity of the fifth Conservative Prime Minister in 13 years blaming NHS staff for the Tories' abysmal failure. Rishi Sunak, how dare you? How dare you? There is a window of opportunity for negotiations before the next round of strikes take pl takes place. A serious Prime Minister would take it. But this is his government in a nutshell. Problems are there to be exploited rather than solved. Meanwhile, patients are left waiting. That's why a Labour government will take immediate action to cut waiting lists. We'll provide an extra £1.1 billion to help the NHS beat the backlog with extra clinics at evenings and weekends, providing two million more appointments each year. Faster treatment for patients, extra pay for staff, the first steps to cut the waiting list and beat the Tory backlog. Paid for by abolishing the non-DOM tax status. Because patients need treatment more than the wealthiest need a tax break. We've also got to deal with the immediate crisis in NHS dentistry. Do you know, things are so bad that the number one cause of hospital admissions among children is tooth decay. People are pulling their own teeth out with pliers because they can't get an NHS dentist. This is Dickensian. 
DIY dentistry in 21st century Britain. That's why Labour will deliver 700,000 extra appointments each year, get more dentists into the communities that need them most, and make sure that everyone who needs an NHS dentist gets one. But tackling the immediate crisis isn't enough. It's our mission to get the NHS back on its feet and fit for the future. Achieving our mission will take time, investment, and reform. Reform is even more important than investment because pouring ever-increasing amounts of money into a system that isn't working is wasteful in every sense. A waste of money we don't have, a waste of time that is running out, a waste of potential because the NHS has got so much going for it. Labour will never abandon the founding principles of the NHS as a publicly funded public service free at the point of use. Never. And conference, I make the case for reform, not in opposition to those principles, but in defense of them. I'm blunt about the fact that the NHS is no longer the envy of the world, not to undermine it, but to reassure people that we've noticed. I argue that our NHS must modernize or die, not as a threat, but a choice. The crisis really is that existential. When I look at leading health systems across the world, the fundamental problem with the NHS becomes obvious. We have an NHS that gets to people too late. A hospital-based system geared towards late diagnosis and treatment, delivering poorer outcomes at greater cost. An analog system in a digital age, a sickness service, not a health service, with too many lives hampered by preventable illness and too many lives lost to the biggest killers. So be in no doubt about the scale of the challenge. Not just because as waiting lists rise, public confidence falls, but because in the longer term, the challenge of rising chronic disease combined with our aging society threatens to bankrupt our NHS. The Tories' answer is all sticking plasters in the short term, but an abandonment of the NHS in the longer term. As we saw in Manchester last week, the Conservative Party dances to the tune of Nigel Farage now, and the more they move to the right, the greater their threat to our NHS becomes. So it falls to us, the party that founded the NHS 75 years ago to rescue, rebuild and renew our health service today. And we will. To answer the historic calling of our founders, Labour's reform agenda will turn the NHS on its head. From hospital to community, analogue to digital, sickness to prevention, a neighbourhood health service as much as a national health service, pioneering cutting-edge treatment and technology, preventing ill health, not just treating it. And what gives me hope are the people working with and for the NHS today who are leading the way to that better future. There is nothing wrong with the NHS that can't be cured by what's right with the NHS. You know, in Sussex, GPs work together, providing specialist and urgent care in the community, allowing patients to see their regular family doctor and giving them greater control over their own care. They're preventing 4,000 patients from having to go to hospital every year. 
primary care will be at the heart of Labour's plan for the NHS. We'll train thousands more GPs, cut the red tape that ties up their time. Labour will bring back the family doctor. <laughs> Faced with the appalling effects of the pandemic on children's mental health, Schools in Bury are working with the NHS to deliver support. The number of children requiring mental health services has been cut in half. Every child struggling with their mental health should get the help they need. Labour will put mental health support in every school and hubs in every community, paid for by abolishing tax breaks for private schools. That's right. Politics is about choices. Labour chooses to give every child the best start in life, not just the privileged few. That's aspiration. And of course, there is no solution to the crisis in the NHS that doesn't include a plan for social care. We will grip the immediate crisis in social care, starting with the workforce. And I'll have the best ally I could hope for, the former care worker turned Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner. Together, Ange and I will deliver a new deal for care workers, a workforce plan, a workforce plan to address recruitment and retention, the professional status these remarkable people deserve, and the first ever fair pay agreement for care professionals, the first step on our 10-year plan for a national care service. One of the biggest opportunities we have is the revolution taking place in medical science and technology. That revolution is happening here in Britain. We're a world leader in life sciences, home to some of the smartest tech entrepreneurs. Take Moorfields Eye Hospital, where artificial intelligence identifies signs of disease on scans with an accuracy equal to world leading experts. They spot conditions earlier and prioritise patients with the most serious diseases before irreversible damage sets in. The next Labour government will arm the NHS with state-of-the-art equipment and new technology to cut waiting times. Our Fit for the Future Fund will double the number of scanners in the NHS so patients are diagnosed earlier and treated faster. But more than that, more than that, breakthroughs in genomics and AI mean that we'll soon be able to predict and prevent illness in the first place. If we combine the care of the NHS with the ingenuity of our country's leading scientific minds, the NHS could once again be the envy of the world. And at the heart of Keir's mission-driven approach is this simple idea. Transformation of the National Health Service must go hand in hand with a transformation of the health of the nation. A child born in Britain today 
should live to see the 22nd century. I want them to be part of the healthiest generation that ever lived. That's Labour's ambition for children. And we will bring it to life by taking tough action against those who are cutting our children's lives short. We will ban junk food ads targeted at children. Bridget's Breakfast Clubs will provide every primary school pupil with a healthy, nutritious start to the day, making sure they have hungry minds, not hungry bellies. We'll introduce supervised toothbrushing to keep kids' teeth clean and keep them out of hospital. And to those in the vaping industry who have sought to addict a generation of children to nicotine with flavours like Rainbow Burst and Cotton Ice Candy, you have been warned. A Labour government will come down on you like a tonne of bricks. You know, back in January, I proposed going even further by outlawing the sale of cigarettes to the next generation altogether. Tory MP said it was nanny state, an attack on ordinary people and their culture. They accused me of health fascism. <laughs> Awkward. Because unfortunately for them, Labour is winning the battle of ideas and where Labour leads, Rishi Sunak follows. <laughs> and unlike weak Rishi giving a free vote to Liz and her cronies, we'll make sure that we vote through the ban on selling cigarettes to kids so that young people are even less likely to smoke than they are to vote Tory. <laughs> Conference. Those are just the first steps of what is needed. Our reforms will be fundamental and deep they have to be, if the NHS is to be there for us in the next 75 years, as it has been in the last 75 years. The choice at the general election is clear. We can see the future with the Tories unfolding before our eyes. A two-tier health service, where those who can afford it go private, and those who can't are left behind. Our NHS reduced to a poor service for poor people. Our country viewed as the sick man of Europe. Labour has a different vision for our future, where no one fears ill health or old age, where people have power, choice, and control over their own health and care, where the place you're born or the wealth you're born into don't determine how long you'll live or how happy you'll be where patients benefit from the brightest minds developing cutting-edge treatments, and where children born in Britain today become the healthiest generation that ever lived. That's Labour's ambition for our country. So to those who say that we're all the same, that voting never changes anything, you tell them. 13 years of Conservative government have delivered the longest waiting lists and lowest patient satisfaction on record. 13 years of Labour government delivered the shortest waiting times and the highest patient satisfaction in history. That's the Labour difference.
and conference. At the general election, when they ask, why Labour? You tell them. Two million more appointments a year to cut waiting lists. 700,000 more appointments with NHS dentists. Mental health support in every school. Mental health hubs in every community. Double the number of scanners. The biggest expansion of NHS staff in history. More doctors, more nurses, more midwives. An NHS that's there for you when you need it. Back on its feet and fit for the future. So let's go out there. Let's give Britain its hope back. Let's give Britain its NHS back, together with Keir Starmer. Let's get Britain, get Britain its future back. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, I don't know about you, Conference, but I can't wait to see um, as the uh, Secretary of State for Health. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and thank you too to Nathan Nathaniel um, for spending so much of your precious time <laughs> with us. Conference, we now move our motion listed on page 10 of the CAC report. The motion is moved by Penniston and Stockbridge CLP and seconded by Feltham and Heston CLP. Can I ask delegates to register at the speaker's desk, please? Conference, my name is Alex. I'm a cancer doctor in our NHS and a first time delegate and speaker. I'm also a councillor in Penniston East, which we won for the first time in 25 years in May, kicking the Tories out. I've been a doctor in our NHS for over 10 years, and I've seen this Tory government chip away at it, bit by bit by bit. So why do we still believe? Why are we all in this room fighting to save our NHS? It's because the NHS has touched all of our lives. We all have our own NHS story. Mine starts mere weeks after its inception in 1948. My dad was born with haemolytic disease and the NHS gave him a blood transfusion that saved his life. That condition took his hearing, but 50 years later, it gave it him back with a revolutionary technology called a cochlear implant that meant he can be here today, sitting in this hall, listening to my speech. Fifteen years later, it saved my mum's life too. She developed a sudden bowel obstruction and surgeons rushed in in the middle of a light to operate and save her life. Five years later, it helped me and my wife welcome our first child into the world. And two years after that, it held our hands as my wife suffered a miscarriage. We've since helped deliver two happy, beautiful children to the world. Throughout all of this, we never had to worry about how we'd pay. We couldn't have afforded my dad's cochlear implant privately. My parents would have struggled to get private health insurance. The NHS was always just there for us, through our darkest moments and our greatest joys. The next Labour government will need to rebuild our NHS so it's fit for the future. We'll train the next generation of nurses and doctors. 
will ensure people can reliably get GP appointments again and will support research to ensure future generations can benefit from cutting edge care like minded. We won't just save the NHS from the Tories, we'll rebuild it for the 21st century. The NHS is a beautiful creation, a revolutionary social policy, a labour policy that shows how a society can truly care for those within it. But it's under threat. Early this year, the Tory MP for my area, Peniston and Stocksbridge, talked about alternative healthcare funding models, essentially spelling the end of the NHS. Well, I've got four words for her. Over my dead body. <laughs> Nye Bevan stood in our shoes in halls like this and said the NHS will last as long as there are folk with the faith left to fight for it. Well, conference, here we are. These people in this room with the faith to fight for it. Join me in that fight by voting for this motion to start rebuilding our NHS. Thank you, conference. Well, that's not terrifying, uh, having to follow those wonderful speeches by Nathaniel, by Wes and by Alex. Uh, Hi, my name's Amy Croft. Uh, I am a delegate from Felton and Heston CLP, first time speaker, uh, and also really proud. <laughs> thank you. Also, really proud to be the first Labour councillor for Chiswick Riverside in West London for close to 50 years. So it's cool. So there's a really deep security that we all feel in a quick, free and efficient access to diagnosis and treatment that we've been lucky enough to have. Uh, when this is not available to us, it also causes a deep sense of anxiety across the country. 13 years of Tory neglect has brought our NH NHS to its knees and that is unforgivable. Conference, our NHS is not for sale, nor will it ever be. Uh, and Labour will always, always be the champion and protector of our NHS. But you cannot neglect a garden for 13 years, even the most beautiful garden, and expect to be able to just pour water on it to get it back to its former glory. You need to nurture it, you need to prune it, you need to sow and you need to fertilise. So Labour must now rebuild our NHS fit for the future. Uh, Talk to the people on the, sh on the floor, talk to the, the nurses, the doctors, find out what works and what doesn't work and build on the things that the NS NHS does brilliantly. Strengthen our social care system to give freedom to the NHS to do its job, improve mental health services, especially for our young people, streamline procurement, invest in technology and cut the waiting times. Let's get Labour's NHS back and let's get Britain's future back. Thank you, please support the motion. Thank you, delegates. I'm now gonna to open to discussion from the floor. I'm gonna take um, contributions in rounds of three. So uh, I see a gentleman there, red tie. Yep, you're just standing up. Um, uh, <laughs> I know everybody wants to get in on this one, but I'm not going to be able to take everybody. Um, there's a, a, a woman just there that, uh, per, is that a purple cardigan? It, you? Yep. A um, uh, lady there with a grey jacket. Yep. And um, gentleman just there. You? Yep. I know. Thanks, Chair. Gordon Mackay, Unison. <laughs> conference, conference. As an NHS nurse for 40 years, I'm proud every day of our health service. An NHS dreamed of by the Labour Party, built by a Labour government, and protected by the Labour movement. And I'm equally as proud of the Unison members 
who deliver that service every day to people who need it. So thank you to the nurses, the cleaners, the admin workers, the ambulance staff, the healthcare assistants, who work together as a team every single day to make people's lives better. Conference three weeks ago, my wife was admitted into hospital on a trolley to a &E. 18 hours later, she was still lying in the same trolley in a &E. That's our health service under the Tories and the SNP. No ambulance to get you to hospital in an emergency. Beds closed down if you get there and services staffed in goodwill as experienced staff leave. Conference, we're just holding on to our NHS, but we're close to losing it. Because while the NHS cares for you, we have governments that don't. In the next 12 months, people across Britain have got a choice to make. Continued crisis under the Tories. Seven and a half million people who need help and waiting lists. Over two weeks to see a GP and surgery delays of over two years. Two years to get your hip and knees replaced when you're unable to walk and in constant pain. The alternative is hope under labour. Investment and treatment, proper staffing, a service there for you when you need it. Unison members in the NHS know where our choice lies. We want a better future for the people of Britain. We want an NHS fit for the future. Conference, we all want one thing. We want a Labour government. Thank you very much. Conference, Ruth Middleton, Chair of Harrogate and Knaresborough Labour Party, speaking in favour of Composite 13. I could talk about lots of things today. Um, the NHS has shaped my life. As a newborn baby, I lived with my family in a tuberculosis hospital in the Yorkshire um, countryside. I trained as a mental health nurse in the 1980s and have spent many years campaigning on the issues of mental health, women's health. I could talk of my experience of critical care, um, of trauma and emergency services, of rehab services and of care services as I did the other day. I could also talk about a good example last year um, when I was able to take advantage of a cancer service in my area that was run by volunteers, community volunteers, but employed NHS physios, to work in a gym that was run by a community group um, and to offer free services to anybody who was affected by cancer. But what I actually want to talk to you about today is just a short story about some of the things that those of us who are in wheelchairs are facing at the moment. This is my wheelchair. It's an NHS wheelchair. Wheelchair services have been hived off in recent years to private firms. They're constantly going and competing with each other to make a profit for the people who are shareholders. They do very little to ensure that their services are useful for those of us with no mobility in my case. I don't exaggerate when I say that I feel that wheelchair services aren't part of the equation. It's true. Just a couple of examples. A few years ago, I could have lights on an NHS wheelchair. That was taken away probably about six, seven years ago. We don't want to encourage you to go out, not at night, not when it's dark. We actually, small, slowly and by little by little, they've taken away my mobility and my rights. I was amazed a few weeks ago to get a letter inviting me for a new assessment, to go to a new building that had been specially designed for wheelchair services. There was a sticker on the letter saying, please note, we have no accessible bathrooms and toilets at this new building at our venue. 
Did, did yeah. you wind up? It, this it surprised yet? me. Sorry. Um, I'm desperate to see things improve. I spent, a while, I spent time recently um, when my chair didn't work. It cost me £1,000 to have that um, repaired, money that I simply don't have. I'm crowdfunding for new chairs. My chair is cobbled together, apparently it has parts from different years, from different chairs. Could, could it's ridiculous. I can't be cobbled together as a person, or I have been. Um, but I just thought I'd give you that example. It's something that's rarely talked about. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry Thank to you. go on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Conference. Anna Dixon, Parliamentary Candidate for Shipley in West Yorkshire. First time speaker at Conference. As a candidate, I'm speaking to people every week on the doorsteps, sometimes nearly every day. The people of Shipley are fed up. They are fed up with things not working. They are fed up with broken Britain. They are fed up with this Tory government. And one of the concerns that I hear time and time again are people struggling to get the health and care they need. The mum who sat with a sick child in a crowded A&E for hours waiting to be seen. The older person waiting weeks to get an appointment to see their GP. The young person with mental health issues told they can't get seen for months. And the woman who can no longer register with an NHS dentist. After 13 years of Tory government, our NHS is at breaking point. People are worried about the future of the NHS, and rightly so. Under the Tories, waiting lists are the highest on record, patient satisfaction is at all-time low, and staff burnt out are leaving the NHS. This is the state of the NHS after 13 years of Tory government. The creation of the NHS is one of Labour's greatest achievements. We had a vision that everyone should be free from the worry of ill health, whatever your circumstances. An NHS there when you need it. I had the privilege of working for a Labour government in the Department of Health and I saw the difference we made to the NHS. Record investment, waiting times down, more doctors and nurses trained, patient satisfaction at a record high. We can and we will do it again. We will deliver, under Wes's leadership, 700,000 extra dental appointments a year. We'll bring back the family doctor. We'll get care into the community and focus on prevention. We will build an NHS fit for the future. Thank you. Just before the next delegate speaks, I will take a final round. Um, and I know everybody wants to get in to speak in this debate, and I'm not going to be able to call everybody. I'm so sorry. Um, so there's a gentleman just there. Uh, there's a woman just there. Uh, you, yes, you. Uh, no, no, sorry, it was the, the lady in green. In green? green? Yeah. Purple? Flowery top. <laughs> it's very difficult to see from here. Um, and uh, there is a, a young delegate over there. Yeah. Younger than me, anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, thanks. <coughs> Chris Webb, parliamentary candidate for my hometown of Blackpool South. <laughs> Conference, I want to bring to light the struggles faced by my hometown and reaffirm Labour's commitment to ensuring everyone receives mental health support they need. I'm proud to be Blackpool born and bred, and I live in a town known for its vibrant spirit and a rich history that is unfortunately plagued by deep-rooted deep -rooted mental health crisis. We can't ignore the fact that Blackpool faces unique challenges, including high levels of deprivation, unemployment, and social isolation, creating a perfect storm, leaving many vulnerable to mental health issues. I refuse to turn a blind eye to those suffering 
and my fellow residents. Every person, no matter where they come from, deserves access to high quality mental health support. I'm proud to lead an award-winning mental health charity in Blackpool, counselling in the community. And after a decade of underfunding, residents now face 18 months on waiting lists for support and it's charities like ours that are stepping up to help those in need. With 70 volunteers and our inspirational founder and CEO, Stuart Hutton Brown, we support over 150 adults and children across our town weekly. And we're going to be supporting hundreds more in our new dedicated children and young persons centre. We must work tirelessly to increase and guarantee resources that are available to meet demand. By recruiting and training more mental health professionals, expanding experience-based services and establishing funds for youth hubs, mentors in every corner of our communities. Under Labour, we will tackle poverty and equality, providing greater opportunities for education, employment and social mobility. I will ensure, as our next MP, that mental health services are accessible, that stigma is eliminated and that every, every individual feel seen, heard and supported. Thank you, Let Delegate. us unite to do this endeavour. Thank you. Good morning, conference at Vince Maple. Proud to be the new leader of Medway Council. The first ever Labour and Cooperative leader of Medway Council A and friends let me say this there could be one of 22 new leaders here because on May the 4th across the country people turn to Labour for their communities to make a change to make a difference and now I'm proud to be part of 7,000 making Labour the largest party in local government And across local government, we stand ready to work not just on this composite, but every composite we're discussing this week. Because it's local government that's at the heart of every community, ready to deliver for our, our citizens day in, day out. And since we got elected on May the 4th, me and my cabinet have been getting to work. Whether it's delivering the cost of living plan we debated and discussed with Keir two days after getting elected. Whether it's my colleague Nishar Khan delivering on tackling poor landlords. Whether it's my colleague Lauren Edwards working closely with the FSB. That and so much more delivering in our communities. And why is that important to this issue? Because actually with those thriving communities, the fact is people's mental health struggles if that isn't in place. And importantly, really importantly, it's the issue of public health. We've had in Medway a 91% cut in our revenue support grant since 2010. We're dealing with that issue. We're having to take some really difficult decisions, but the alternative is this. We end up with a society that doesn't exist. So we're going to be keep working hard, as we did in the way to May the 4th, to make sure that we deliver that Labour government that can work hand in hand with local government to deliver for communities up and down the country. Thank you, conference. Good morning, conference. Juliet Campbell, parliamentary candidate for Broxtow. <laughs> conference, the last 13 years of Conservative government has presided over neglect of our public services, which has left residents in Broxtow and across the country unable to access the care they need. Our NHS one of our country's greatest achievements, Labour's greatest achievement, has been failed by the Conservatives. Residents in Broxtow cannot get to see their doctor. They're unable even to register with a dentist. Conference, for people living with long-term healthcare conditions, their quality of life is as important as the longevity of their life. And under this chaotic Conservative government, our social care system is on its needs. And people are actually burning through their, their savings to fund their own care. 
It's time for us to professionalise the work that our social care workers do. A Labour government will take our social care system right into the 21st century and recognise the value of unpaid carers and families that save this country millions of pounds every year so that people can live independently. Better rights, decent standards, fair pay and better training for our amazing care workers. It's a world-class national care service. Labour has shown what early care and support can do. Just as Labour provided our Sure Start programme that not only transformed the lives of millions of families, it saved the NHS millions of pounds also, only for it to be cruelly dismantled by the Conservatives. Yeah. Labour has fixed Conservative mess before in our NHS, and conference, Labour will do it again. Let's make Britain the place that we want it to be. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Delegate. I, I don't have time to call any more speakers. We, do, we are running significantly over time and people will have transport booked. So this is the final speaker in this debate. Thank you. Uh, conference, come back at Marshall from Lincoln CLP. Now, when I think of what it means to be proud to be British, I'd look no further than our NHS. The principle of an all-encompassing, fully covered, free at the point of use healthcare system for everyone, completely non-discriminatory. But clearly, conference, we cannot be proud of the current state of our NHS. 13 years of cuts and chaos. It is absolutely criminal. Just over 10 years ago, on the 13th of January 2013, my family and I celebrated my dad's 45th birthday. Oh, my dad, just quickly, is a proud socialist. His claim to fame being blocked on Twitter by our absolute disgrace of a Tory MP in Lincoln who couldn't stand up to very valid criticism. It wasn't a normal birthday for us. Four days earlier, he was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer. So we sat on the ICU, comforted by the absolute grit and determination of overworked NHS workers, especially the nurses that, despite the consequences of the situation, went the absolute extra mile to make my dad's last birthday as comfortable as possible. These people are just wonderful, and they deserve so much more than just us clapping for them. Three days later, he passed away. In the months leading up to this, he was very ill, but he persevered. He continued to go to work, and we continued to struggle along. The thing that burns in my head, though, is the state of the GP surgeries. When we went to the GP, it was like being packed like sardines in a tin can. Overworked doctors without the proper time, the resources, or the access to services for a proper diagnosis. By the time he had a diagnosis, it had spread and it was terminal, and he wasn't given the fighting chance that he deserved. But today we have the technology and we have the capability to fight for a better NHS, and we have and we need the drive to do it. Thank you. We, we have to bring an end to the postcode lottery that the NHS is built upon. It's a punitive system, starving the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you, Delegate. Conference, I urge you to back this motion. Let's get our NHS back. Lincoln needs Hamish Faulkner, and Britain needs a Labour government. Thank you. Thank you, Delegates. Uh, that concludes the... Conference, the glitterati has arrived. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> um,
conference. So uh, that concludes uh, the final policy debate of annual conference this year, and quite probably the final policy debate before the general election. We're now going to take uh, the votes. Um, we will take votes initially um, by show of hands. Um, on the motions composite uh, 12, the industrial strategy, education and skills. Can I see those in favour of the motion, please? Thank you. And any against? That's carried unanimously. Um, composite 13, um, NHS fit for, fit for the future. Can I see all those in favour of the motion, please? Thank you. And any against? That's also carried unanimously. <laughs> and that concludes the votes for annual conference 2023. <laughs> Now, conference last year, our sister party in Australia won a majority government for the first time since 2007. <laughs> we will hear for, from our international guest speaker in just a moment, but first we have a video message from Australia's Labour Prime Minister, Anthony Alab Alabanzi. It's my pleasure to send a message of friendship and solidarity to all of the delegates in Liverpool for this year's Labor Conference. I have fond memories of attending the conference there in Liverpool a few years ago. In the UK, as in Australia, Labor conferences showcase the great democratic tradition of our party and our movement. Because while our Labor values of fairness, opportunity and aspiration are timeless, the way we give those values life and meaning and relevance to our citizens is constantly evolving. And that's why the labour movement has always had the strength and the self-confidence to open our doors to debate, to embrace new ideas, and to engage with the passions and ambitions of our members. Yes, sometimes those passions run high, but that's a good thing because the stakes are high, because the job of a labour conference isn't just to help shape the policy positions of the party in abstract. It's about positioning the party for government so it can deliver policies for the country. That's another truth that UK Labor and Australian Labor hold in common. We are movements for progress, not protest. We measure ourselves by our deeds, not just our words. And we know that the work of meaningful change and lasting reform depends on winning government, carrying the message beyond the conference hall to the homes, workplaces and communities that Labor at its best has always served. Friends, the days ahead are important. I hope they're enjoyable and rewarding too. All the very best at the conference there and I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you from Canberra. Conference, the war in Ukraine may not be in the news to the same extent as it was this time last year, but the borders of Europe, um, democracy is still under threat, and the brave people of Ukraine continue to fight. Labour stands resolutely with Ukraine and our NATO allies. It is therefore a privilege to invite <coughs> Oleg Zander. Corin Yenko, um, the Deputy Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, to address conference. Thank you. Conference, dear colleagues, first of all, I want to say warm words of gratitude from all Ukrainian people by all support that the United Kingdom sent to our country. Thank you very much.
every ballot, every penny, and every word of support matters. Especially I want to say you deep respect from our soldiers from battlefield. They have honor to see every two weeks when I travel there. In time of this unprovoked aggression from Russia to Ukraine, every weapon unit saving dozens of lives of our defenders. Thank you from them. <clears throat> On the other hand, I know guys who train it in UK, and they assure me that the days of training here were the most excellent days in their personal military careers. Thank you for training of our soldiers. <clears throat> Conference. It's such an honor for me to be here with you today in Liverpool, in a city which matters so big for everyone who likes music. As a former music reporter and musician, I feel so affected here. If I would be here even two years ago, I would discuss with you about whom impact in history was more, John of Paul, or, or if Dua Lipa will be the new Madonna. But now in my head and heads of my countrymen sounds another music. Unfortunately, it's music of the war. Sounds of shooting bombs and shells, whistles of missiles flying above our houses, crackle of Iranian drones, Screaming of our children, they wake it up at the night after next alert signals. I know that Liverpool streets remember such sounds, but I don't wish all of you to hear that ever. Conference, how can we deliver it? What we need to do tomorrow, next week, next year, to turn around the wheel of history? What we need to do to return the world to the right way of searching pathways to peace all around? I think we need to do more, and we need to become bigger. First of all, in our ability to collaborate and build bridges. Because if we will not start to build bridges, we will need to dig trenches. <clears throat> Almost 600 days of dozens of years of unconditionally support UA by UK gives to the world a great example of such bridge building. Dear friends, I would like to say on this honorable stage about true fraternity between our nations. Your support has been truly instrumental in absolutely all respects. On behalf of the Ukrainian parliament and of the people of Ukraine, I want to thank Kir Stammer, David Lamy, John Healy, Alex Sobol, each uh, MP, activist, and trade union for the incredible supportive position you have taken in Ukraine and its fight for our common freedom. Each Ukrainian has the hope that the UK will remain a key ally as Ukrainian tackles the challenges of the present and future. And the British response with the same kind of attitude. The UK government's military and humanitarian support is co complemented by numerous community initiatives led by ordinary Britons, collecting various nasty goods, sending donations, helping Ukrainian refugees. Only in the first months of this full-scale invasion over 138,000 Britons recorded the desire to host Ukrainian refugees. Our refugees are very thankful for all of you. Thank you very much. Conference. We value a lot our close relations with the Labour Party. Each your step matters a lot. Your support for Ukrainians integration to NATO makes the entire Europe a safer place to live in. His summer personal drive behind the creation of a special tribunal for the crime of aggression gave the UK and the world a powerful impulse to restore justice. 
There is a significant potential for depending our cooperation, uh, accelerating the end of the war and implementing our common vision embodied in President Zelensky, his formula plan. First of all, we rely on labor solidarity and support for inclusive reconstruction to rebuild the Ukrainian economy, deal with landmines, build a new progressive Ukrainian in Europe. You know that the war damage to Ukraine is colossal. It's estimated up to one trillion pounds. Yet we have an opportunity to support a much needed reconstruction without any traditional burden on the British taxpayers. We need to use the frozen assets of Russian oligarchs and the Central Bank to rebuild Ukraine. <laughs> Second, we need to be tired on the sanctions imposed on Russia. Currently, it's able to use loopholes and mitigate the sanctions effect to produce military equipment. Can you imagine that Russia can produce up to 50 missiles on a month still. It's unbelievable. We often find Western components in Russian missiles and drones, bombing residential houses and hospitals. This is clearly unacceptable and should be urgently dealt with. <clears throat> Third, we need to increase our efforts to protect Ukrainian women and children to draw attention to forced deportation of Ukrainians to Russia, especially of deportation of our more than 20,000 kids. We need to be united in our response against atoms of Russify Crimea, to disseminate propaganda and to destroy the Ukrainian nation in a genocidal war Russia is waging. Conference. I want to share my conviction with you. This battle is not only about Ukraine. This battle is about our values. It's about the whole world, it's about the humanity. To win it, we need to stay united. We need to think of it with a sense of urgency which arises from the fact that every day, the best my brothers and sisters in Ukraine are sacrificing their lives for our peaceful life, for our future. To act in a constant way, we need to have a single desire, a single strategy for the war's end. We need to share the same object and contribute with our actions to its achievement. The restoration of the 1991 borders include Crimea, guarantees of non-repetition, Ukrainians' membership in a and NATO. Conference. Finally, I want to say what I know for a long time about you, about your brilliant party. The Labour was founded to uphold justice for British workers. In my opinion, justice is an excellent foundation for the development of our common vision for the end of Russian aggression and for our common peaceful future. Let's make justice prevail. Thank you so much, conference. Thank you so much, Alexander. Now, conference, I might have mentioned it once or twice, but we had a historic by-election victory in Scotland just before a conference. <laughs> but I did just want to say, please don't forget that we have by-elections coming up in two more uh, seats, Mid-Bedfordshire and Tamworth next week. Please do everything that you can to support our candidates in those uh, elections and make sure we have two more historic wins to add to our collection. conference before I call our final speaker please can we have a very well deserved round of applause for the venue security staff our stewards for making 
this event, the best Labour Party conference I think we've ever had. And conference, can we have a massive round of applause for party staff? Because Because party staff have gone from by-election to by-election to conference, we'll be going to by-election to by-election, um, and they ha are working round the clock for the delivery of a Labour government. And many of them stay up very late into the night at conference, not partying like the rest of us, but producing all the material for the next day of conference. Um, some people email it many uh, hours of the morning <laughs> <laughs> doing uh, their job. And as my final act as uh, Chair of the National Executive Committee, I'd just like to ask David Evans to give staff a day off. <laughs> 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 After the by-election. After the by-election. <laughs> um, and I think that motion was just seconded by um, my successor as chair of the NEC. Congratulations on your election, James. <laughs> Conference, it's been an absolute honour and a privilege to be the chair of your National Executive Committee. And before I call our final speaker, we are premiering the brand new party political broadcast. <laughs> this is a cup of tea. This boiler makes a hundred a day. This cafe survived three lockdowns. Now it's threatened by soaring prices. Labour will switch on a new publicly owned company, Great British Energy, meaning energy security and lower bills making families and businesses better off. This is a library card from one of Tito's schools, the one where she fell in love with poetry. Because out of all her schools, there was one teacher who truly inspired her. Labour will break down the barriers to opportunity by putting a specialist teacher in every classroom, funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. So a one in a million teacher will be joined by thousands more. These are Nat's letters, all his appointments, all the cancellations, the waiting that changed his cancer from survivable to incurable. For now, he keeps teaching, keeps playing for as long as he can. With labor, you'll get quicker cancer diagnosis and start treatment within 30 days. Funded by closing the non-DOMS tax loophole. Getting the NHS back on its feet so you get faster treatment. These are Sam's front door keys. But this rental doesn't feel like home. Despite saving and downsizing, Sam can't get on the property ladder. Owning your own home shouldn't be out of reach for working people. Labour will kickstart economic growth and get Britain building again with more people owning their own home and priority for first-time buyers. This is Ranim's phone. Her aunt Noor holds onto it now. Ranim used it to call 999 13 times in five months. Multiple times on the day her abuser attacked her and her mum. She was waiting on the phone when he killed them both. With Labour, trained abuse specialists will support 999 handlers, funded by eliminating police waste, cutting drastically the level of violence against women and girls. 
Labour's five missions will improve the lives of working people. All our plans are fully funded. It's time to get Britain's future back. And so conference, our final speaker, Jonathan Ashworth. <laughs> thank you very much, Joanna, and thank you for everything you've done chairing our national executive these last 12 months. And it is also an honour to be at this podium following Alexander Konienko. Alexander, your people retain our steadfast support. Our solidarity remains unbreakable. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. <laughs> now, friends, what a truly remarkable conference this has been. Now, some of you might have heard that apparently some people call me Johnny Sparkle. Well, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to give the mantle up just yet. <laughs> but I am also a loyal member of the Shadow Cabinet. So I can speak, I think, with some qualification and authority in saying, didn't Keir sparkle yesterday? He's given <laughs> Labour its sparkle back. Keir Starmer, our leader, our candidate for Prime Minister, strong, determined, focused, taking us from the despair of our worst defeat in history to the hope of a better future, with Keir, will give Britain not just its sparkle back, but its future back too. And through every step supported by our friend, the woman who will deliver a new deal for working people, who will level up every community. She glitters as well, our Deputy Leader, Angela Rayner. <laughs> but most importantly, thanks to you, our members, our trade unions, for your contributions here this week, for your tireless efforts, which gave us that astounding victory in Rutherglen and Hamilton West, and for the work that you do, week in, week out, in every community. Thanks to you, and so many like you, we end our conference here in Liverpool, ready for a general election. The Tories ended theirs, ready for another leadership election. And did you see them last week? Did you watch it? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you should have done. It should have gone off on after the watershed, I tell you. But, but we had Penny Mordaunt. She kept telling the conference to stand up and fight. None of them stood up, but they did fight each other. We had, um, we had Michael Gove complaining about the Tory tax burden. We had Rhys Mogg complaining about the lack of economic growth. We had Jeremy Hunt complaining about civil service numbers. We had all of them complaining about runaway costs of HS2. It's astonishing. Who do these people think has been in charge these last 13 years? <laughs> Did you, did you see the fringe? There was Pretty Patel skipping the light fandango with Nigel Farage. And now Farage is waltzing his way back into the Tory party and Sunak too weak to stop him. 
And then there was Liz Truss too. Letting it be known, she wants a second chance to outlast the lettuce <laughs> and crash and smash family finances all over again. Well, that may have been their conference fringe, but I tell you, it's the Conservative Party's future. More turmoil, more risk, more chaos, with Truss, Braverman, Rees Mogg, Farage calling the shots. Vote Sunak, get Truss. That's the fifth Tory term. We have to stop, friends. And then, and then, and then we were promised we would see Rishi be Rishi. But no one liked what they saw. <laughs> the, this, is, this is absolutely true. The Tory members' WhatsApp group, this is absolutely true, it's not made up, branded Sunak a loser who has, and I quote, about as much enthusiasm and appeal as a doorknob. It's a bit harsh on doorknobs, they are at least useful. But <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we got, so that didn't work. So then they told us that Rishi Sunak is the details man. But he didn't mention the biggest detail of all. Well, we won't let him forget. The country won't let him forget that the Tories crashed our economy, sent mortgages through the roof, and forced working people to pay the price. <laughs> this isn't a details man. It's a man in denial. So, he went to, can he went to Manchester and cancelled a train line to Manchester and then published a list of supposed replacement transport projects. Well, luckily for Rishi, I am a details man. And I've been checking the list. <laughs> Dueling the A1, first announced in 2010, never delivered. Upgrading the Ely Junction, announced in 2016, never delivered. The Don Valley Line, Announced in 2020, never delivered. Electrification between Leeds and Manchester, announced a decade ago, never delivered. But there was the durham leamside line, announced by Sunak on Wednesday, pulled by the Tories on, Tuesday, on Thursday. Well, I think we can agree that now goes in my column as never delivered. <laughs> so there we have it, Rishi's Railways, the modern equivalent of Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> a, fict a fictional railway on a fantasy island with the controller cancelling services and the trains hitting the buffers. <laughs> <laughs> and there was... There was more. There was more. He's pretending to cancel 20 mile per hour zones. Did you see that one? Well, given his leadership is a slow-motion car crash, I understand why he wants to ban slow motion, but <laughs> we also had cabinet ministers peddling dark and dangerous internet conspiracy theories. We had that seven bins policy bit um, junked, and the most bizarre claim of all about a meat tax. Well, conference, frankly, it turned out it was all a load of bull. <laughs> So, listen, the, the British public saw it last week. They've got the measure of Sunak. He's out of touch, out of his depth, out of ideas, and out of time. And you know what? So many Tories, they know it too. Have you ever seen a political party, after 13 years in office, so silent on their record? As Keir reminded us yesterday, we all remember the previous Labour Prime Minister outlining what we had achieved together in government, the winter fuel payment, the short start centres, the shortest waiting times, the minimum wage, you remember it. But after 13 years, but after 13 years of the Tories, after 13 years of the Tories, what of them? The economy crashed. Real wages stagnant, mortgages up, 25 Tory tax rises, schools at risk of collapse, record NHS waiting lists, 
Universal credit, cut. Half a million more children in poverty. Rivers and beaches full of sewage. Mental health care in crisis. Councils going bust. Party gates with more raves in Downing Street than Ibiza. Rising pensioner poverty. Record food bank use. Shore Start centres axed. Social care on its knees. Fire and it rehire. Billions lost to Tory cronies for useless PPE and dodgy loans. Seven reckless chancellors. Five hopeless prime ministers. That's the Britain they've been breaking. That's what we choose to change. I hope, um, I hope Gordon's not going to sue me for plagiarism now. But, uh, <laughs> but there was something we did agree with at that Tory conference. Rishi Sunak announced it's time for change. Yeah. Yes, Mr Sunak, it's time for change. So call a general election and let the country choose the change it needs. <laughs> and when that election comes, all we will ask, as our, one of our fa uh, previous leaders famously said, is a chance to serve. A chance to serve on the basis of our values the values we share with the British people. Values that demand we bring down the barriers to opportunity. That's why we'll introduce reforms to teaching, new breakfast clubs and technical excellence colleges. Because when this government fails our children, they fail this country's future too. We'll get the NHS. We'll get the NHS back on its feet because healthcare isn't just about curing illness and the relief of pain. It's about fairness and equality too. So this party that created the National Health Service in the 20th century will rebuild and reform it in the 21st century as well. And we'll cut waiting lists with more appointments, more staff, and finally deliver parity of esteem for mental health care, ensuring all children get the care they deserve. And to working families, and to working families, hit hard with higher mortgages and rising prices, to pensioners shivering under blankets in the cold, not able to pay the heating bill, to the young people struggling to get on the housing ladder despite working all hours in jobs that simply don't pay enough, and to everyone paying more in tax and receiving less in wages. Your cares, your struggles are our concerns, our struggle. So Labour will, as our brilliant Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves said on Monday in that commanding speech, unlock investment, tackle the rising cost of living, create well-paid skilled jobs, make families better off, bring down energy bills and deliver the climate justice our children's future demands. And, and, as, and as Keir said yesterday so powerfully, rather than blocking home building, we'll build homes. Home ownership, so for, for many, so such a pipe dream under the Tories will be a reality with Labour. This is the change. This is the change a Labour government will bring. Mission-led, focused on the country's priorities, with stability and sound finances the foundation, not the recklessness and chaos of another five Tory years, with Labour government serving the people, not government serving itself. So friends, friends, as we pack up and say farewell to Liverpool for another year, let the message from this conference be clear, that to all who yearn for change, that to all who voted Conservative in the past, but now see today how far this Conservative Party has moved away from you, to all those who love this country and know it can be so much better, Join us on our journey to a brighter day. To every member and supporter watching at home, join us on this campaign. Put into action 
what it says on our membership card, by the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we achieve alone. So with our sights raised, let us dare to glimpse at the possibilities of the future. And with confidence and conviction, together, let's go out and win. Thank you. conference to lead the traditional rendition of the red flag and Jerusalem we welcome back to conference Anna Marie Newton who is a soprano singing tutor and choral director based in Liverpool and she is accompanied by Stephen Manning's director of music at Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral
let's go and win the general election conference. Safe home.